You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and before I get started, I just want to say that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working for the station which is airing this broadcast, or for the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into my first subject, which, or my first segment of the show, which is What's topping the box office? The top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And the movie that I predicted, not, admittedly not on this show, but in my own mind, would be number one this week, turned out to be number one this week. Blade Runner 2049, the long-awaited sequel to the original Blade Runner that came 35 years after the original. I think that might be a record, but I don't know for sure. But either way, Blade Runner 2049 made $32.8 million at the U.S. box office this weekend and $81.9 million at the box office worldwide. And that's against a budget of $150 to $185 million. I was only given a range. I wasn't given the exact number. But I will tell you that Blade Runner 2049, regardless of what its actual budget is, is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but that may change in the coming weeks. Number two at the box office is also the highest grossing or the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, which is The Mountain Between Us, starring Kate Winslet and Idris Elba. The movie grossed $10.6 million at the U.S. box office this weekend and $13.7 million worldwide. That's against a budget of $35 million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but it has much less budget to make up than Blade Runner 2049 does, so we'll see how it does. It was number two at the box office last weekend. This week, in its fifth week of, in release, it is number three, having grossed $10 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. But against a budget of $35 million, which is exactly the same as the mountain between us, and pretty modest, especially given its, its subject matter, it has so far grossed $305.3 million in the United States alone and $604.4 million around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And the number four highest grossing debut movie of the week is also the number three highest grossing debut movie, which is My Little Pony the Movie. <laughs> Very masculine title there, but My Little Pony the movie grossed $8.9 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, and it grossed $12.7 million worldwide against a budget that I, I don't know what it is. It hasn't been disclosed to me, so I can't say whether this movie is a not a hit, certified hit, or a tentative hit. It's probably not certified, uh, probably not tentative either, but... Of course, we'll have to see if it does better in the coming weeks. Kingsman, The Golden Circle, was number one at the box office last week and the week before that. This week, it takes a huge drop to number five, having grossed $8.7 million. But against a budget of $104 million, Kingsman, The Golden Circle has so far grossed 80, that's eight zero point five million million here in the States, and $253.7 million worldwide, which means it's not surprisingly a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. American Made is number six in the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $8.4 million this past weekend in the United States. Against a budget of $50 million, that's $50 million, American Made has so far made $30.8 million here in the States and $98.5 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit that is very, very close to being a certified hit and probably will be a certified hit worldwide by next week. The Lego Ninjago movie, unlike the other two Lego movies that have come out so far in the last four years, is actually kind of struggling at the box office. It's not doing badly, but it's not doing as well as other people predicted it would. 
The Lego Ninjago movie earned $7 million in the box office this past weekend in the United States. Against a budget of 70, that's seven zero million million, the Lego Ninjago movie has only earned $44.1 million here in the States. So again, it's not doing badly, but it's not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world, it has grossed $77.4 million, which means it is a tentative hit around the world, but... It's going to be a long while before it becomes certified. Victoria and Abdul has been out in theaters for three weeks, but this week it was released to theaters nationwide, and this is its debut in the top ten at number eight, having grossed $4.2 million at the U.S. box office. Again, actually, I don't have a budget for you, but I can tell you that it has grossed six million dollars at the U.S. box office so far, and thirty-one point one million around the world. So I can't tell you whether or not it's a hit or not a hit yet, but it's pulling in some promising numbers, especially for an independent film. Flatliners is number nine at the box office this weekend, having fallen from number five last week, which is an equal fall to Kingsman of the Golden Circle. But unlike Kingsman of the Golden Circle, Flatliners is struggling quite a bit. It earned $4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend against a budget of $19 million. That's $19 million. Flatliners has only grossed $12.5 million here in the States and $18.3 million worldwide, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. And given that it's number nine, we may not see it in the top 10 next week. So it looks like it's a flop. But number 10 at the box office this weekend is Battle of the Sexes, which in its third week in release fell from number six last week to number 10 this week, having grossed at the U.S. box office $2.6 million. Against a budget of $25 million, which is actually pretty hefty for a film that hasn't been in wide release for at least its first week, Battle of the Sexes has so far grossed $7.8 million here in the States, and $9.4 million worldwide, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. But chances are, I think you're going to hear a lot about this movie come Oscar season in a few months. Of course, I'm predicting that, but but even if it doesn't do well in the in the theaters, which it doesn't look promising for that movie, my guess is it's going to recoup its losses by way of video on demand. I think people are going to order this, you know, pay-per-view in the next couple of weeks, and it should recoup some of its losses. Woo! Let's get crazy! In movies, when someone at a party jumps into a pool fully dressed, everyone cheers them on and jumps in too. Just so you know, in real life parties, nobody jumps in after you. You just look stupid. Come on, jump in. Come on. Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television, or some community access station is picked up my show, to which I say thank you very much. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Blade Runner 2049. This is the long-awaited sequel to the original Blade Runner, which came out in theaters in 1982 and was directed by Ridley Scott. Now, the original Blade Runner bombed at the box office, but its original cut 
and actually several director's cuts have since proven themselves to not only be cult favorites, but almost underrated classics, at least underrated at the time. Now it's a highly praised movie. Now for Blade Runner 2049, which takes place 30 years after the original Blade Runner, Ridley Scott did not come back to direct this film. He did produce it, but he didn't direct it. Instead, the director is Denis Villeneuve, who is, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, he is a French-Canadian um, director from Quebec. Um, I'm not going to pronounce the town he's from because I haven't, I'm, I'm not very good at French. I, I've never taken a single class of it. But Mr. Villeneuve has directed such previous films as Sicario, which I thought was one of the most underrated films of 2015. He also directed Arrival, which came out last year and was nominated for Best Picture. And his other movies, which you might have heard of, I'm speaking to American audiences, is Prisoners, which came out in 2013, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Hugh Jackman. And also there was one called Incendies, which man might not be familiar to at least English-speaking audiences. But anyway, Blade Runner 2049 is about a young Blade Runner's discovery of a long-buried secret that leads him to track down former Blade Runner Rick Deckard, who's been missing for 30 years. So Bla the original Blade Runner, directed by Ridley Scott and starring Harrison Ford, who reprises his role in this movie as Rick Deckard, was an action movie. It certainly had a lot of philosophy behind its its subject which i think makes has made it a cult fo which has given it a cult following over these last couple of decades but this movie is a lot more philosophy and while there is some action in it it certainly is probably tipping the scales compared to the original blade runner but there is a lot to like about blade runner 2049 and if you really think about it a sequel like Blade Runner 2049 probably has a lot more going against it than it has going for it. Of course, a lot of people from the original Blade Runner, including Harrison Ford and Edward James Olmos, reprised their roles in this movie. I'm a little sad that M. Emmett Walsh didn't come back, but uh, that's just one minor grievance. But a movie that comes 35 years after the original probably has even more going against it. There have been some movies that have come a, a few decades after the original and have not been particularly well received. The one sequel that comes to mind is The Odd Couple 2, which came out literally 30 years after the original Odd Couple. And even though Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau came back to reprise their roles, critics panned the movie, including Siskel and Ebert as I recall from way back in 1998. But anyway, Blade Runner 2049 is not only a great movie because of its story, which is admittedly a lot more complex than the original Blade Runner, but the special effects not only keep the original Blade Runner at an arm's length, but they're also very impressive in and of themselves. And it certainly, I think, portrays probably a more realistic future than other films that have that have depicted the future, particularly Back to the Future Part Two, and maybe even arguably the original Blade Runner, which it, it was filmed in 1982, came out in 1982, but actually took place in the year 2019. Now we can thank our lucky stars that the future depicted in Blade Runner, even though it's you know two years from now, probably isn't going to be as dark, but 2049, don't put it past this movie for it to maybe accurately depict the darkness of 2049, depending on what go goes on these next couple of years. Long story. But anyway, the Blade Runner in this story is somebody who's only known as K, and he's played by Ryan Gosling. And it's pretty well established at the very beginning of the movie that Ryan Gosling, unlike Harrison Ford's character, allegedly, is not actually a real human being. He's a replicant. And the technology of replicants have come a significantly long way from 30 years prior when the original Blade Runner took place. And replicants are not necessarily dangerous. I think there are some that have gone rogue and are dangerous. In fact, there is a great appearance in the very beginning of the movie by Dave Bautista, who is a pro wrestler from 
the, both of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies where he plays a rogue replicant, and the fight between him and Ryan Gosling sets the movie off right. But you're wondering throughout the film whether or not Ryan Gosling's character is human, is a replicant, and how exactly he came to be. And I think it... It's a movie that raises a lot of interesting philosophical questions that I think the late Ray Bradbury would have approved of, not to mention Philip K. Dick, whose story here is based on characters created by him in the story, Do, do Robots Dream of Robotic Sheep? I, I don't think I got the, 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 the title of that correct, but I've got about a minute to figure out, okay, it's... The name of the story written by Philip K. Dick is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Sorry to get that one incorrect. But anyway, so Philip K. Dick has long since died, so he did, obviously didn't have any, any involvement in this film, but I think he would be very impressed by the writing of this film. And there are some great supporting performances in this movie by Robin Wright, Jared Leto, and a standout performance by Ana de Armas as not a replicant girlfriend of Ryan Gosling, but actually a holographic girlfriend of Ryan Gosling. So I don't want to spoil anything, plus I've got 10 seconds left. Blade Runner 2049 is a knockout. I can't say whether or not it's better than the original, but it's certainly on par and is well worth watching on the big screen. I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores, and in 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. Hey, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Right, sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run... Uh, oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right. We have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the crap. Oh, crap. Yeah. There was a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's, our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. No. The show is called Fact Up. Up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. And it's an hour long. Yeah. Only on BFR. <laughs> Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is My Little Pony, the movie. One of the great things about being a film critic is I can walk up to the box office and proud, maybe partially proudly state that I'm going to buy a ticket for My Little Pony, the movie, because it's for research purposes. Right, guys? Right? <laughs> no, actually, since the reincarnation of My Little Pony and the fact that it became a uh, cartoon, uh, sort of remade into a cartoon a few years ago from its 1980s inception, is this current incantation of My Little Pony, unlike the original, is not made to sell toys. Of course, they do sell My Little Pony toys, but unlike the original cartoon, that is not the remake's original intent. So My Little Pony the movie is, of course, based on the very popular cartoon, which is not only popular amongst young girls, as to be expected, but apparently there is a group of guys, you know, heterosexual males who call themselves bronies. And these are guys who have a wide array of interests from building motorcycles and to drinking beer and they love My Little Pony. So, yeah, I guess going to a My Little Pony movie if you're not, you know, a father or if you're not, not a straight male or gay male is perfectly okay. And I'm sweating bullets as I'm explaining this, so I'm just going to move on to what this movie is about. So, My Little Pony the movie takes place in Ponyville. And there is, this is, Ponyville is a land that is so sugary sweet you might get diabetes after watching this movie for five minutes but as these movies go a dark force threatens ponyville and the main six 
ponies embark on an unforgettable journey beyond Equestria, where they meet new friends and exciting challenges on a quest to use the magic of friendship to save their home. So this movie has a lot of celebrity voices. It certainly has some voices or some voice actors from the original show, like Ashley Ball, who plays the voice of Applejack and Rainbow Dash, and also Andrea Libman, who does the voice of Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie, amongst other <laughs> My Little Pony names that make me blush just saying it. But actually, one of the dark forces of the that, that takes over Ponyville is a rogue My Little Pony with a broken... Um, horn on her forehead named Tempest Shadow who's played by Emily Blunt and even though Emily Blunt is British in this movie she uses an American accent which still sounds menacing but she could have used her British accent and it would have been just as intimidating but anyway these six ponies some of, who fl some of whom fly and some who can't venture off into another area of Equestria, which I guess is their whole universe, to try to seek help to bring this dark force down. And even though Tempest Shadow is more of the ringleader of this dark force, there's actually a very imposing villain in this movie, who's this giant monster that kind of looks like Scuzzlebutt from the South Park cartoons. And his, his name is the Storm King, and he's played with Sardonic Delight by Liev Schreiber. And there are also some other amusing supporting characters. There's one food-obsessed ogre by the name of Grubber, who's voiced by Michael Pena, and he certainly has some amusing moments. I've got three and a half minutes to talk about this movie, so I guess I gave you the plot, I gave you some of the major characters, but I think overall, did I like this movie? Yeah, I kind of did. I mean, I initially did not expect at all for this movie to... I, I didn't expect to be impressed by this movie, but this movie had very good animation. And I certainly... there's, I certainly believe there is a standard that movies based on TV shows, especially ones done by their original creators, have to have, in that a movie based on a TV show and especially one made by the show's original creators, has to almost reintroduce itself to a film-going audience that may or may not be familiar with the show. I personally have not seen a single episode of the new My Little Pony. I Come to think of it, even though My Little Pony was popular when I was a little kid, I didn't see any My Little Pony cartoons either. I saw the commercials for the toys, but I never actually watched the cartoon. So... I got most of what Ponyville is about in the universe of Equestria from watching this movie. So to anyone who's not familiar with My Little Pony, fortunately you won't be lost by the story and you'll get a gist of what all the characters are like. And I certainly thought that one of the strengths of this movie is you get the gist of all the ponies' personalities within a couple of minutes. You know, it's not really lost on you. However, there are... I think people who are unfamiliar may have a lot of trouble keeping up with the names. They may not know Rainbow Dash from Applejack or Fizzle Pop Berry Twist from Princess Sky Star, and that's okay. I don't think you really need to know all the ponies' names, and you might get them from repeat viewings. Who knows? But what, I think one of the only things that confused me about watching this film is I didn't get why some ponies had unicorn-like horns and some didn't. And I kind of got the gist of what the ponies did with their unicorn horns, but I didn't quite get it. I, I was a little naive to that fact. I also didn't understand why some ponies had wings and some didn't. And the six protagonists that are going beyond their home to get help some of them had wings, so why didn't they fly to their destination rather than literally at one point walk through a desert? I didn't understand that either. And while some of the protagonists had wings and some didn't, I also didn't understand why one pony didn't hitch a ride on another pony's back that had wings 
and flew to the place. I thought that was a little contrived, but overall, I was actually pretty impressed with My Little Pony, the movie. It's not a film I loved, but it did make me laugh actually a lot more than the Lego Ninjago movie. And for that reason, I give it a checkout. I think it's a movie that probably fans of My Little Pony, especially girls, but not alienating any bronies out there, will like. I, th I think they will be satisfied by the animation. They'll like the story. I certainly like the story. Some facts might be lost on people who aren't fans. Driving means freedom. Exploration. Fun. Pride. Flexibility. Travel. Protection. Ability. Friendship. Excitement. Escape. Control. Independence. Distracted driving means danger. Recklessness. Irresponsible. Chaos. Police. Devastation. Injury. Life. Death. Safe driving means staying alert and staying alive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s and all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Mountain Between Us. This is the latest starring Kate Winslet and Idris Elba, who I don't believe have been in a movie together before. But if they haven't, this is a good first movie for both of them. But anyway, this one is directed by Hani Abu Assad who is not a particularly uh, director with a familiar name, but he has been in movies that might be familiar to Western audiences, such as Paradise Now, which he directed in 2005. And I think that's pretty much about it. I know that Paradise Now was a pretty big international hit. But The Mountain Between Us is a movie about two individuals, one who is a photographer and the other who is a doctor, uh, a neurosurgeon to be more specific, who stranded after a tragic plane crash, these two people who were strangers before they met at the airport, must forge a connection to survive the extreme elements of a remote snow-covered mountain. When they realize help is not coming, they embark on a perilous journey across the wilderness. Kate Winslet plays the photographer, Alex Martin, and Idris Elba plays the neurosurgeon, Ben Bass. There are also appearances in this movie by Bo Bridges, who plays the ill-fated pilot of the uh, twin-engine jet that is taking Idris Elba and K Kate Winslet's characters to their respective destinations after certain flights have been canceled at their airport. And there, there are a lot of things to like about The Mountain Between Us. Particularly, I liked the survival story. I didn't think it was entirely realistic. One critic online pointed out that Kate Winslet is or Kate Winslet's character is in the wilderness for uh, I, I think about a week and her hair never gets greasy. Yeah, there's that. Also, Idris Elba doesn't seem to get any sort of injuries or even scratches. He says he has some scratches and some bruises, but you never see them. And also, his hair doesn't seem to get greasy either. So that's one unrealistic part of it. The other part is no one seems to get frostbite or any other sort of conditions that come with being out in the wilderness as, as long as these people are. And they're in the wilderness in 
the winter in the Pacific Northwest, some, somewhere around Idaho or Wyoming. The movie never exactly states, but it doesn't really have to. You, you know that they're leaving Idaho and they're on their way to Colorado, so they're probably in the Idaho-Wyoming area. But in any event, I did think that Idris Elba and Kate Winslet, both of whom I like as actors, I don't think I've seen them in anything especially bad. I've, I've seen them... I've at least seen Kate Winslet in one bad movie, but she wasn't bad in it. But they had a decent amount of chemistry, but Kate Winslet's character is actually engaged to be married, and the reason she is in such a hurry to get a flight to Denver, despite all the flights being canceled because of the weather, um, I can't remember where I was going with that sentence. But in any event, that's the reason she's in a hurry, and... Idris Elba's character, uh, Ben, is in a hurry because he is going to Colorado to treat a 10-year-old boy who is having brain surgery, and apparently he's the only one who can do it. So when Bo Bridges' character flies them over the, what I can presume are the Rocky Mountains, he eventually suffers a stroke and the plane comes crashing down. So this kind of thing definitely could happen in real life. But the other thing that gets me is that the reason these two are desperately taking the single-engine flight to Colorado is because the flights have been canceled at their airport because of the weather. But then when they're stranded, within the first three days of them staying and surviving on this broken plane that's in the middle of the wilderness, this storm never comes. So that's one of the first things that seemed questionable to me. But as I said, I did like the survival elements of the movie to a certain extent. But then there are some parts that are picked up in the movie and seem to be dropped entirely. Like there's one point where they kill a bobcat and they cook him for dinner. But then you, you would expect a whole bobcat, especially one the size of the one you see in this film would sustain them for maybe a whole week, but then they cook the bobcat for one night and then they move on. And I'm thinking, drag that thing with you, you know? I don't care how heavy it is. If I'm hungry enough, I will sustain my appetite on that thing for a whole week. But that doesn't especially pertain to them and, and their plight. And I think one of the things that really sends this movie off the rails, not flagrantly, but certainly enough for me to give this movie less than a glowing recommendation is the fact that the movie centers, especially after the two characters' ordeals, on a love story between them. Now, initially, there's some sexual tension between them. I, I won't give away exactly what, what happens with them, but th there is even more tension because Kate Winslet's character is engaged and was going to be married the, the day after this plane crash happened. And of course, the plane crash was the best laid plans of mice and men that went awry, which of course happens. But then again, once the, I, I'm not, it, it's really hard for me to say what happens, but the aftermath of this, of this survival story leads to a will they or won't they scenario or one of those stories where you're where they want you to wonder will they or won't they and honestly i didn't really care there there were various moments in this movie where the movie could have ended but the movie just kept sustaining this mystery of will these two get together will kate winslet's character dump her fiance for this guy and i i do think that idris elba and kate winslet are both charming but i didn't care about the love story if they had ended it at a certain point it would have been great but as for now i give it my recommendation of a checkout i do think it's very well acted kate winslet and idris elba do the best they can with this material and they do really well i i was really taken in with their survival story i wasn't taken in by the potential love story which i won't give away the western scrub jay 
I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, oh, oh. He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. He had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Freedom to soar with the hawks above Union Square. Boston, fourth place of revolution and complaint. Radio, miniaturized to fit in the pocket of your overalls. Together they spell bostonfreeradio.com. Making waves with Boston's all-Italian language program featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui su bostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Victoria and Abdul. This is a movie about Queen Victoria, and it actually has Judi Dench reprising her role as Queen Victoria after she played the role literally 20 years ago in the movie Mrs. Brown. Well, this time Judi Dench is back as Queen Victoria, and this, this movie details Queen Victoria's last few years of her life where she strikes up an unlikely friendship with a young Indian clerk named Abdul Kareem. This is based on a true story, although because of racism and probably more xenophobia, the evidence of Abdul Kareem's relationship, friendship, with Queen Victoria was actually destroyed. All their diaries, all their journals, all, most of their photographs were actually put to flames by Queen Victoria's son right after Queen Victoria's death. That's all detailed here, and when I say Queen Victoria dies, that's kind of a spoiler, but not really. Queen Victoria in this movie, played by Judi Dench, is 81 years old, and I don't know if Judi Dench is that old herself. She was born in... Oh, she's actually older. She is going to be 83 this December, so... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything further than that. But, of course, Judy Dench does a really good job playing Queen Victoria in this movie. And I actually did notice something about actors playing royal monarchs. If they play them once in a movie, they usually play them again. For instance, of course, Judy Dench has played Queen Victoria in two movies. Uh, Kate Blanchett has played Queen Elizabeth I in two different movies, for which she was nominated for Best Actress in a Leading Role twice. Michael Sheen has played former uh, British Prime Minister Tony Blair twice, once in the movie The Queen and once in the HBO film The Special Relationship, which co-starred Dennis Quaid as Bill Clinton. And Helen Mirren has played uh, Queen Elizabeth II once on the big screen in the Academy Award winning The Queen, and once actually on stage in, I think, a play that was based, either a play that was based on the film or the basis of the film. I don't know which, but either way, Helen Mirren reprised that role. So I think it goes to show you that once British filmmakers make a film about a certain monarch and they play that monarch pretty well, they want to repeat that, and I, I certainly respect that. But also, what, what makes this movie fascinating, Victoria and Abdul, is that I had no idea. I, don't, I, I admittedly don't know very much about Queen Victoria. I do know she was a... She was one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history, and I think she had the longest reign before Queen Elizabeth II just beat that, I think a very short time ago, but I didn't realize that she had a, a friendship with a, a young Indian person who act, actually happens to be a Muslim. So there's certainly some tension in the movie, not among, not between Queen Victoria and Abdul Kareem, uh, Queen Victoria played by Julie Dench and uh, Judy Dench, excuse me, and Abdul Kareem played by Ali Fazal. But there's also some certain consternation within 
the royal family, particularly Queen Victoria's son and future king, Prince Bertie, Prince of Wales, who's played in this movie very well in a little bit more of a straight-laced performance by Eddie Izzard. And also there are other members of the government and the state who also object to this friendship, including Lord Salisbury, who's, who's the prime minister at the time, played by Michael Gambon. And why Queen Victoria had such a liking to Abdul Karim, it's actually stated very subtly throughout the movie. At, at first, it starts out by <laughs> Queen Victoria acknowledging how Abdul Karim is a very handsome gentleman, but eventually, after that, there is a certain chain of events that leads Victoria and Abdul to have a deeper relationship. And there certainly are unexpectedly funny moments in this movie. I know certainly American audience American audiences may not gravitate towards a movie about the British monarchy, particularly because unlike a lot of people in Great Britain, we don't know a lot about the monarchy. I think we know as much as we remember from maybe Western civilization in high school or maybe a few courses in college, but it's not ingrained into our psyche like it is with British people. And, and that's okay. But I go into these movies not expecting to be, not expecting to have my mind blown with entertainment or amusement, but I go to this, these kinds of movies for the same reason I go to any movie, to learn something. And in this case, it is learning about a certain piece of history. And it's also important to know that around the time this movie takes place, which is the turn of the 20th century, around 1900 and 1901, pretty much the last few years of Victoria's death, there is some tension between Great Britain and India, particularly because Great Britain at the time owned India. India was a British colony, which it remained until 1947. But this movie strongly implies that the Britain might have relinquished India as a British colony if more people had known about the relationship between Victoria and Abdul, or if Queen Victoria had lived just a few more days. Of course, that's implied, that's not said, and it probably didn't exactly need to be said. But as I was watching this, I was wondering if Mohandas Gandhi was even familiar with this friendship. Because, as I said, at the end, and this isn't spoiling much, the uh, Prince of Wales, Prince Bernie, uh, excuse me, Bertie, destroys all most evidence that of, of the relationship between Queen Victoria and Abdul Karim. And again, this relationship is platonic. It's not. It, it doesn't go that far. But the, there are great performances all around. Judy Dench does a great job as always, and Ali Fazal also has a notable debut or a breakthrough and i give this movie a knockout let's go inside the mind of a 10 year old i should have worn earrings today buckle up sarah michaela's got like the best earrings sarah buckle up i wish my name was michaela we're not hitting the road until you buckle up honey oh yeah seat belt I wonder if there's pizza at school today. It can be tough getting through to kids, but it's your job to make sure they're wearing your seatbelts. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. I love those real six sons. They're the ones that move. Thinly blow, new rocky toe, intensify and groove me. All this and more on Home Patrick Saturdays at noon on Boston Freeway. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Flatliners. This is the most recent remake of the 1990 film, which was directed by Joel Schumacher and starred Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, Kevin Bacon, Oliver Platt, and William Baldwin. Now, that original Flatliners movie had its problems, but it's one of Joel Schumacher's better movies. And I think it's certainly, it's one of those films very much like 8mm that, and maybe one other film of which I can't figure out, but Joel Schumacher has made some good movies, like, as I said, Flatliners, um, the movie I just mentioned, 8mm, and there was also one with Robert De Niro and Philip Seymour Hoffman. I can't remember the name of it, but it was really good. But <laughs> he's also made some bad movies, like St. Almost Fire and probably most especially Batman and Robin. But Joel Schumacher has nothing to do with this remake. He's only credited for, well, creating the, the characters, along with the original story writer, uh, Peter Filardi. Uh, yeah, Filardi. So this movie is a straight-up remake, probably with some more... It, it takes place modern day, very similar to the original one, which took place in then modern day, 1990. And it's about five medical students, obsessed but by what lies beyond the confines of life, who embark on a daring experiment. By stopping their hearts for short periods, each triggers a near-death experience, giving them a first-hand account of the afterlife. Now, the tagline of the original Flatliners, if I can find it, is that, well, five medical students experience experiment on near-death experience that involve past tragedies until the dark consequences begin to jeopardize their lives. So one of the problems with the remake of Flatliners is it kind of forgets that consequence part about these medical students who pronounce themselves dead, or rather who become clinically dead for a minute or two, and then are brought back to life by their fellow students, and then bring something back with them. And initially, you, you sense, especially through some of the computer technology, that their brains are working a lot more differently when they come out of this near-death experience than if they don't. And, of, of course, that, that sort of falls in line with the original, but the scare elements of this movie just basically don't work. Of course, these people in the movie are haunted by something they've done previously in life, either something they've done they've reg regretted or some life they've ruined along the way by somebody who's either currently living or currently dead. But those parts of the movie are surprisingly not scary. In fact, there was one scene where one of the medical students who experienced this near-death experience, who's played by Ellen Page, is haunted by the spirit of her younger sister who died when she was in the car with them, with her, on a plane in a... Um, in a car crash. And when the spirit of the young girl comes back, it's just simply not scary. And there, there were times where, there was one time where Ellen Page is looking into a car because she sees something move. And I, I knew a jump scare was coming on. In fact, I counted on my hand, something I've never done before, five, four, three, two, one. And then when I got to one, the jump scare happened. So if I could predict when the jump scare was coming, and I've seen a lot of movies, so I know when jump scares happen and sometimes when they set up, but if I could predict that, I'm sure someone else who's probably a little bit more familiar with horror movies than I am, and certainly someone maybe who's a lot more casual about going to the movies could probably predict that part too. I do like the actors in this movie. In fact, all five of the main actors I, I thought were really good. I'm already familiar with 
Ellen Page, Diego Luna, Nina Dobreff, and Kiersey Clemens. I think they're fine actors. James Norton, who plays Jamie, who's kind of the Stephen Baldwin character, not Stephen Baldwin, William Baldwin character in this movie. He's the guy who's uh, brilliant, but also a womanizer. I've seen him in a couple of other movies, but he hasn't left too much of an impression on me. The only actual movie I've seen him in besides this one is one that came out four years ago called Bell, which instantly gave me a crush on Gugu Mbatha Ra, but I'm just, <laughs> just saying. But other than that, I haven't seen him in many other films, but I thought he was pretty good in this movie. But again, it just got predictable. I, I thought that it was a big mistake to make a movie or a remake of a movie that was already pretty good. Actually, I was mentioning this to my Facebook audience, but not to you guys. The director of Blade Runner 2049, Denis Villeneuve, actually reported that he wanted to make a remake of the movie Dune, which, well, was based on the book by Frank Hebert, but was also a much maligned movie that came out in 1984 directed by David Lynch. It's unquestionably David Lynch's worst film. But I think Mr. Villeneuve is on to something because he's remaking a bad movie. And that's what people should do, especially movies that came out and vastly underperformed the box office and disappointed both critically and commercially. Those are the kinds of movies people should be remaking. And Flatliners, I thought, was such a good movie in its own right. It wasn't a perfect movie, but I thought it was really good. And, of course, it had the stellar casting of Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, and all the rest. So why remake a movie like that? And, again, I thought the lead actors did what they could with the material given in this film, but the scare elements were not there. <laughs> I'll get back to you about that, Joe. But anyway, <laughs> Facebook comment. But anyway, Flatliners fails, and I think it pretty much flatlines as a movie. As the movie progressed, probably about 30 minutes in, I found myself actually not caring about the characters or their fate, which is really unfortunate. Also, of course, as I mentioned, it's not scary, even though it probably should have been a lot scarier than it was. But when the jump scares are predictable, it's not worth recommending Flatliners, and it gets my rating of a flunk out. It's a great looking movie, it has great characters in it, or has great character actors in it, but overall, it is just plainly a waste of time. It only takes a minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. And you can do it at doihaveprediabetes.org. But you're probably not going to, are you? Kids, work, listening to the radio. You're busy, which is great because busy people can't get prediabetes. Oh my, I read that wrong. <laughs> they can. Should have worn my glasses. So visit doihaveprediabetes.org and take a short test because prediabetes can be reversed. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tune that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwood. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archive at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And now that I've reviewed the five movies I'm going to review for this show, it's now time, or I have reviewed for this show. Oh, my God, redundancy. It's now time to get into my segment, What's Coming Out Next? These are the big movies that are coming out this coming weekend. The biggest movie that's probably going to be coming out this coming weekend is a biopic called Marshall, about a young Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American Supreme Court justice, as he battles through one of his career-defining cases, which I'm guessing, if I know my history, Brown versus Board of Education. So Marshall is played in this movie by Chadwick Boseman, who is going to play and has played the character Black Panther in the Marvel Comics universe. Before he played Black Panther in last year's Captain America Civil War, Chadwick Boseman also played 
Jackie Robinson and James Brown in two separate movies. So he's going for a third biopic. I think Chadwick Boseman might as well be called the biopic guy. And if he plays Martin Luther King in a, in a future movie, I will not be surprised. But th that's not undermining his, his acting, or, or if anything. I think he's a very fine actor. So... Chadwick Boseman is playing Thurgood Marshall in this movie, and the movie also co-stars Josh Gad, Kate Hudson, and recent Emmy Award winner Sterling K. Brown, who you can find on TV in the TV show This Is Us. I have only seen one episode of This Is Us, but I hear it's a really great pro. I hear it's a really great TV show, and I've seen Sterling K. Brown on it, and he is fantastic in it. So, Marshall is coming out in theaters this Friday. That is a movie I guarantee you I will see, and I'll let you know what I think when I do my show next week. Another movie that's coming out is what looks like a comeback vehicle for Jackie Chan. It's called The Foreigner. And Jackie, Pla ja Jackie Chan plays a humble businessman with a buried past who seeks justice when his daughter is killed in an act of terrorism. A cat-and-mouse conflict ensues with a government official whose past may hold clues to the killer's identities. So The Foreigner, to me, sounds like a movie very much like Taken, but it's great to see Jackie Chan do this kind of movie. And it, it's certainly a, a change from a lot of the comedies and the action comedies that Jackie Chan has done before. And I will be immensely disappointed if Jackie Chan does not do his own stunts in this movie. But, again, this is another movie I will see. It is rated R, which is kind of strange for a Jackie Chan movie. Because I always thought of Jackie Chan as an all-ages type of entertainer. But, in any event... The movie's coming out this Friday. This is a movie I will see, and I'll let you know what I think when I review the show or when I review the movie for my show next week. This is another movie that I'm going to see. It comes out Friday the 13th. It's called Happy Death Day. It sounds like, just by its title, a remake of one of those 70s low-budget horror films, but I'd be interested to see how it is. I'm not expecting to see to be blown away by this because let's face it a lot of horror movies have disappointed me in recent years or recent weeks months yeah maybe even years but anyway happy death day is about a college student who relive who relives the day of her murder with both its unexceptional details and terrifying end until she discovers her killer's identity the movie doesn't star many people who you're familiar with probably and i'm certainly not familiar with them but this is a movie that's probably worth seeing on friday the 13th probably a good halloween movie i'll see it and i'll let you know what i think next week another uh, the last movie i should mention is a documentary or may maybe it's not a documentary it's a drama about well a psychologist by the name of William Moulton Marston, who is a Paul... Uh, let me just tell you what the title of the movie is. The movie is Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. So again, it's about the psychologist William Moulton Marston, and he has a polyamorous relationship between his wife and his mistress, and he creates the beloved comic book character Wonder Woman and creates a lot of controversy, controversy around this comic book character. So the story with William Moulton Marston is, yes, he did create the character of Wonder Woman, and apparently there are certain weapons that Wonder Woman uses, including the Rope of Truth, that came about as a result of, allegedly, William Mol Moulton Marston really liking bondage. Hmm. <laughs> so that kind of mires the creation of Wonder Woman a little bit, but probably not too much to turn people off from the fantastic movie that came out this summer starring Gal Gadot. And there is a Justice League movie coming out in November, and that movie is, well, I, I don't even think you need those other superheroes. Just have Wonder Woman fight the bad guys. She's certainly capable of doing that. But anyway, that does it with words on film for this week words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and i am your host and movie critic dan burke it's been great talking about movies with you and until i see you next week i'll see you at the movies